Hello fellow archaeogastronomers. What are you doing here? Good to see you anyway. This is the Delicious Legacy Podcast. A podcast all about food, history and old, old recipes. And I'm your host, Thomas Dinas. Thanks for stopping by and sharing this adventure with me. Now, as I'm sure you all know by now, on this podcast we like to go uh, obviously deep in time, but also wide in space too. And there is um, always something deeply, deeply fascinating and worth exploring with Persian culture and Iranian food too. Today, we are back to Persia, exploring the rich, fantastic, almost mythical culinary history of ancient and medieval Iran, a vast country with amazing history and obviously amazing food that influenced people and nations throughout the world. Given, of course, its strategic geographical position in the middle of uh, trade routes between Europe and Asia, of course, and uh, Africa and um, the steppes in the north. On today's episode, we are going to explore in more detail the Persian cuisine of the Sassanid Empire, the main rival of uh, the Byzantine Empire for over 400 years, and of course, the subsequent period of the Arab conquest of Persia, and of course, the mix of influences and the transmission of uh, the Persian rich cuisine and culture via Islam throughout Africa and all the way to the Iberian Peninsula. So come on and join me on this uh, amazing archaeogastronomic journey. But firstly, I would like to thank all my Patreon backers all these years for supporting the podcast and making it happen. Your support means a lot to me and, of course, the help that you provide financially, it means I can research the episodes and um, find uh, guests and create uh, these episodes with more realistic world-building capabilities. So from $3 a month, you can help to the podcast to grow and uh, get uh, more exciting uh, new guests and episodes for everybody out there. As a Patreon supporter, you get the podcast early and ad-free, plus extra bonus content, and of course, lots of uh, writings and recipes uh, exclusive only to Patreon backers. So if you're a Patreon backer, thank you so much. If you're in the free tire of Patreons and... Uh, you want to get access to exclusive content, as each episode has exclusive content, of course, uh, please sign from $3 a month. And of course, if you are not a patron at all, do join Patreon and, uh, yeah, be one of uh, the gang. And of course, there I've got um, uh, links to sources and material and um, other stuff that you can... uh, find uh, valuable information about ancient food and history. By the way, if you want to contact me and um, ask me any questions about ancient food, or if you have any ideas about episodes, or you want to just uh, get in touch and share some thoughts about certain foods and episodes and so on, please do get in touch. And of course, um, oh, for Patreon backers, you can uh, get in touch there and ask me any questions you like, and I will try and answer and um, of course, with other listeners through Acast, YouTube, uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, very grateful for your support. If you want to get in touch, do get in touch through my email, which is the, the delicious legacy podcast at gmail.com. So the delicious legacy podcast one word at gmail.com or on uh, Twitter or X as it's called, I'm The Delicious Legacy, and um, also on uh, Instagram, The Delicious Legacy, and on YouTube, of course, I'm like Thomas Dinas, N-T-I-N-A-S, and the podcast is The Delicious Legacy Podcast. I've also got a bunch of recipes 
of the Malbian Greek uh, website, UK's uh, Greek uh, delicatessen, uh, where you'll find some modern remakes and takes of ancient food and ancient inspired food created by me. So you can go there and try and um, recreate those ancient recipes. That's malbiangreek.com. Okay, without further ado then, let's go to part two of our adventure in uh, ancient uh, Persia. Several desserts are associated with uh, special events. Kachi, a saffron cream for example, is eaten uh, by new mothers on the first and fifth days after giving birth. Halva, which um, prepared during the first three days after the death and after the eve of the seventh and fortieth days of mourning. It is offered to family, friends and the less fortunate. There is also Solechzar, the saffron pudding, which is reserved for the whole day in remembrance of the dead. Of course, now, nowadays the Iranian pastries and desserts are a lot more involved uh, after they went a further period of experimentation and refinement uh, during the 19th century. And there are plenty, plenty of uh, delightful and complex Iranian desserts. Even the word uh, candy in English uh, comes from the Persian word for cane sugar, which is kant, spelled like in English, of course, Q-A-N-D. Roses are very prominent in um, the sweets of uh, Persia. And the roses began their slow journey to the West, all the way back in the 3rd century BC, when they appeared in the botanical garden of Aristotle in Athens. They had been sent from Persia, along with other specimen plants, to be used as medicines and so on. And during the centuries and millennia that followed, uh, roses spread throughout the north of Europe and West. Um, We've begun to use uh, the flowers in the same way as the Persians did. So they were given as gifts, scattered on fountains or walkways during festivals and festivities, and then, then be fashioned into decorations for dining tables. However, the difference is that in Persian cooking, the flower's delicate fragrance and taste is something uh, that has been explored for millennia. Fresh rose petals, for instance, they were used in salads, they were used to make uh, strong wine, they were steeped to produce rose tea, cooked into jam and used to scent honey. The fresh petals also were mixed with sugar later on to make rose petal sugar and to be infused with the subtle taste and the memorable aroma of the flower. Dried rose petals with cinnamon, cardamom and cumin form the delicate Persian spice mix called advie which gives many dishes its distinctive flavor. In other forms, uh, rose as rose water and oil, uh, these flowers have um, given fa- flavor to food um, since at least 500 BCE. Thousands of years ago, Zoroastrians used it in their purification rites. And of course, roses are essential to Persian cooking today as well. The rose water is used um, to flavor rice pudding, baklava, and the wonderful Persian chewy ice cream, for instance. And of course, it makes very good sorbet. Rose water, with its name in Persian, golab, has its own history. In the 7th century, Arabs borrowed the word as a term for a drink with water and honey or syrup. In English, golab became julep, originally used for any sweet drink that helped medicines go down, then for any comforting drink. Uh, Golab's latest incarnation was in Kentucky, in the mint and whiskey mixture known as mint julep. And with rose water and attar for roses, you might say, the practical cook answers the poet's lament for the brevity of beauty. When the rose is withered and the garden is gone, you will hear no more the night's gale song. When the rose is withered and the garden laid bare, in attar of roses the scent is still there. An important invention for the world, and especially for Persia, was um, the ice house or ice pits, uh, which uh, were called Yakchal. And this um, I first mentioned in an episode about the history of ice cream in uh, the first season of the podcast. And uh, these Yakchal are typically dome-shaped um, structures above ground. And they have a massive subterranean storage space. And they have 
shade walls and ice pools for the winter where you create the ice and then you store it in the summer. And these uh, structures, they seem to date as far back as uh, 400 BCE. I'll put a couple of links uh, on the show notes uh, to find out more about them. Basically, during the hot summer days, of course, in the hot and arid Iranian plateau, this will be used to, for preservation of foods. But also, it will make um, for iced chill treats and traditional Persian desserts, uh, as sorbets and sarbets, as we call them, and faludem. Basically, Yakchal is optimized to take advantage of the physics of evaporating cooling and radiative cooling. And um, the fact that um, the arid uh, desert climate is low in relative and absolute humidity. So the low relative humidity increases the efficiency of uh, the evaporative cooling due to the vapor pressure differential. And the low absolute humidity increases the efficiency of radiative cooling because the water vapor in the air otherwise inhibits it. So most yak chals operated like a traditional ice house. Uh, the tall conical shape of the building is to optimize the solar chimney effect, creating a convection current to guide any heat, any remaining heat upward and outside through an opening at the very top. And so obviously the air inside the yak chal remains cooler than the outside. The yak chal itself is built of a unique water resistant mortar called sarouge and it's composed of sand, clay, egg whites, lime, goat hair, and ash in specific proportions. And it's resistant to heat transferred. And it's thought to be completely water impregnable. In effect, provides insulation, effective insulation, year long. So with this um, yak chal providing ice, and the love of Persians for sweet things, we have the birth of this new uh, drink, Sarbat. The flavorings for this uh, ice and snow drink was syrups made by combining fruit or vegetable juice with honey and sugar or date or grape molasses, boiling this mixture down to intensify the flavor, and then sipped through a mound of crushed ice or snow. And it was a delightful drink for all. Um, especially became even more popular uh, for everyone after the Arab conquest when uh, the Islam forbade uh, the use of wine and alcoholic drinks in general. And sarbats could be either sweet or savory. And it was a particularly uh, popular drink for Isfahani people with sugar, with a pinch of salt, lemon or pomegranate juice, squeeze of garlic or lemon, all mixed in crushed ice. And this sweet and sour mixture not only quenched the thirst, but uh, stimulated the appetite. So yeah, through the caravan routes and the exchange of ideas and uh, trade with East and West, this uh, became the sorbets of Turkey and Syria, the sorbet of Spain, the sorbet of Italy, sorbet of France, and sorbet of England. So throughout Europe, we have different versions of iced mixtures, usually based on fruit. Yeah, basically, if, <laughs> if you go to somewhere like uh, Sicily, you find a lot of uh, ice-flavored um, drinks and sweets and desserts, all thanks to Yakchal. Persian gardens, well, gardens in general, continue to play an important role in the life of all Persians, even more so in cities. At the Rashki Bishit, meaning envy of paradise, some two miles out of Siraj, a foreigner is taken for a picnic by some Persian friends, and it was raining. So the foreigner expressed a regret that the weather was uh, so bad uh, as they sat in the pavilion watching uh, the dripping trees. Bad? exclaimed his host. Why? It is beautiful weather. Just the day one would wish. A real spring day. There is nothing which a Persian enjoys more than to sit sipping his wine from the shelter of a summer house while he gazes on the falling raindrops and sniffs up the moist, soft air laden with the grateful scent of the reviving flowers. This little anecdote gives us the whole meaning of his garden to a Persian. It is not a place where he wants to stroll. It is a place where he wants to sit and entertain his friends with conversation, music, philosophical discourse and poetry. And if he can watch the spring rain pouring down, so much the better for he knows it will not come again for months and months and months. Moving on from um, 
ancient Persia to Sasanian Persia, the greatest uh, rival of the Byzantine Empire, one of the greatest rulers that Iran had was Husro I, which uh, he left a wonderful speech about uh, Iran as a garden and its walls. And these wise words are captured in uh, the Shahnameh of Ferdowsi, the epic poem we saw in the beginning, in the beginning of our episode. It goes like this. Iran is like a last spring garden where roses ever bloom. The army and weapons are the garden's walls and lances its wall of thorns. If the garden walls are pulled down, then there will be no difference between it and the wilderness. Take care not to destroy its walls and not to dishearten or weaken Iranians. If you do, then raiding and pillaging will follow and also the battle cries of writers and the din of war. Risk not the safety of the Iranian wives, children and lands by bad policies and plans. As I said, the epic poem called Shaname by the poet Ferdowsi was written in around 1000 um, of our common era. It's a masterpiece and a nation-defining masterpiece poem that it became the favorite story of every Persian village visited by the storytellers of the time. And it traveled by sea and land and was taken up by storytellers in Russia and was liberally borrowed from by later Persian poets and the poets of European romances several centuries later because good stories travel. And that was a massive, uh, massive poem of 50,000 um, verses, I believe. I'll put a show note again with this so you can find it. In the same poem, and we have lots of uh, different um, literary texts from the time that gives us information about food and dishes and uh, customs of Sasanian Empire, of Sasanian court and Sasanian food. We have a young knight that he wants to be admitted to the court of the king. So he tells all about his skills to the king, trying to say, look, I'll be useful to you. Uh, so the king questions him on uh, what he is best at. Uh, and it's lots of different categories, 14. And uh, in nine of them, so nine of these categories that he is good at were about food. So it's all about what's the best wine, the wine of Shiraz, uh, the best meat for Kores, which he suggests a lamb two months old fed on his mother's milk, or beef brisket uh, cooked in consomme and then sprinkled with sugar, a gazelle served in vinegar, mustard, moori sauce, garlic, dill, and caraway. Then there's an earliest recipe, something like a baklava with lentils. Talks about canapé cheeses, nuts and herbs rolled and sliced to be served uh, before the main course. So the muri we talked about, this muri sauce, is a Sasanian sauce, um, something like a fermented barley sauce, similar to soy sauce or the fish sauce of the ancient Greeks and Romans. And it was very strong and pungent and powerful and salty. It was another one of these umami flavors that's been very popular throughout um, the world, it seems. And from the Sasanian kingdom, the Sasanian empire was spread throughout the Arabic world later on. And it was very, very well known and used in many dishes. And this is the period now that we have a lot of um, texts and recipes surviving this uh, change around the 10th century uh, C, where with the Arab conquest of Persia a couple of hundred years earlier, and the end of the Sasanian kingdom and Sasanian Persian empire, um, we have the influx of Arab influences and uh, Islam. But at the same time, the Persian um, culture, in a sense, superimposes itself to the Arab conquerors and creates um, the Islamic Caliphate of the Abbasids and beyond, which um, we have texts and we have um, food culture and uh, culinary arts and we have science and the philosophy and all this stuff centered around uh, the amazing medieval city of Baghdad. The books of the period are nothing uh, sort of incredible. We have uh, The Annals of Caliph's Kitchens by Ibn Sayyar al-Warak, which I spoke uh, before and um, in different um, episodes about medieval cuisine and about, uh, and about Arab, um, Arab cuisine and so on. So this particular culinary book was written in the second half of the 10th century and uh, 
contains about 600 recipes. And of course, many of these dishes are extremely complicated and they require ingredients beyond uh, the reach of uh, the average uh, citizen of the period. There are some classic ones that transcend uh, class barriers, in a sense. There's a dish called Judaba, or something like that. Apologies for the pronunciation. A dish that could be prepared with a number of different um, ingredients, such as apricots or even bananas and honey, for example. But essentially involved roasting a chicken over bread, letting the juice soak in. And uh, Chizaba was eaten by common people and caliphs alike. Al-Warak even uh, tells us the readers about the story of, uh, of the caliph Al-Mamun, the son of Harun al-Rashid, which uh, he dressed in disguise so he can go to the local neighborhood um, eatery that specialized in that dish. And when uh, Al-Mamun's officials react with horror to the notion that he would uh, uh, eat in such a common hole in the wall, he responds thus with a question, the commoners drink cold water like we do. Should we abandon it to them? The annals of uh, Caliph's Kitchens, uh, al Warak's uh, culinary compendium, also has uh, dishes for Christians who were fasting during Lent. There's even instructions of, on how to make yogurt from coconut milk instead of cow's milk. And um, there's obviously a heavy Persian influence throughout the recipes. Many recipes feature this, the classic sourness that is a characteristic of uh, the Persian cuisine. Uh, the start fu- fruits, the vinegars, the fermented dairy products, all the stuff uh, used and infused with the, with the Arab um, culture and uh, spread uh, through, throughout North Africa and Spain to Europe as well. And we also have a uh, use of uh, dried fruits and nuts uh, throughout this book. And of course, spices. There are things like saffron, cassia, galangal, asafoetida, coriander, caraway, black pepper, cinnamon. There are recipes for a rich honey-soaked bread that is stuffed with dried fruits and nuts. Sakmiyat al kawas. There are fritters called zalabia, which, when cooked properly, the butter forms a delicate, crunchy, hollow spirals that burst with honey. There are vinegared stews called sikbajat. Complicated recipes such as uh, stuffed whole fish cooked uh, three ways, uh, where basically you cook each part of the fish in different, um, in three different ways simultaneously. In a sense, you try to achieve three different textures. So basically, a bit of the fish is partially wrapped in layers of cloth, uh, so the head is roasted, while the silted meat section is braised, and the thinly wrapped tail is fried. And of course, there is pasta, a slippery pasta with meat and a dipping sauce, laksa with mam, leaf and sibag. Obviously, we know now that pasta and all the typical noodles and all that kind of wheat-based products, in a sense, they evolved simultaneously in the East and the West, and not only in China, but also in ancient Greece and Italy, but also in uh, Persia too, and perhaps Persia can claim but it has some of the oldest ones. One of the first uh, pasta dishes recorded in the 10th century Arab cookbook um, calls it by the Persian name laksa, which means slippery. And um, in eastern Iran, Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan and parts of the western China and Indonesia, they still use a variation of the name laksa to refer to a dish that uses white flat uh, strips of dough. Perhaps it was the Arabs that introduced uh, this uh, type of noodles, since Arab traders went from the West, Spain and Sicily all the way to Indonesia. And um, in Iran it's customary to eat noodles before embarking on something new. They symbolize the choice of paths among the many that life spreads before one person. Eating those tangled strands is like unraveling the Gordian knot of life's infinite possibilities in order to pick out the best. Noodles, Persians believe, can bring good fortune and make new endeavors fruitful. That is why noodles are always served in Oruz, the Persian or Iranian New Year's Day festivals. Another traditional occasion is on the third day after friends and relatives have gone away on a trip. It is believed that by eating noodles can send them luck as they follow the path 
of their journey. Another legend or story from the time is of a king that made um, all the cooks in his palace to all cook the same dish so he can decide who's the best of all, who's the best of all of them. That's another story from medieval Persia. So they all cooked sikbaj, which is our vinegar stew that we mentioned before. Very important to the Persian cuisine. And this dish was eaten always cold. The meat juices would congeal and form an aspic jelly. And that was something that it was texturally and flavor-wise uh, desirable. The Persian people and people of the Middle East in general seems that they were connoisseurs of sourness. They loved all these um, different vinegars made from dates or grapes uh, or unripe grapes, the, the juice of unripe grapes, veg juice, uh, buttermilk, yogurt and um, all the different uh, dairy products. And of course, we talked about the sourness and the deep umami rich flavor complexity of uh, muri, which is a barley fermented sauce. And vinegar plays part in many recipes in uh, the book of uh, the Caliph Sel Enels. And um, yeah, it seems like um, today we're kind of rediscovering this art of uh, this lost art of uh, using um, different vinegars and different uh, variations of depths of acidity and sourness and the sweetness in the different ve- vinegars to our cooking. Um, that is like the balsamic vinegar and we have the sherry vinegar and cider vinegar and uh, red and uh, white and um, rice wine vinegars and so on. Yeah, that's something that um, the Iranians um, had um, and experimented for millennia. A very interesting condiment of the era was called kamak, which was a mix of milk with solid muri, the sauce that we talked about. And it was very pungent like a very, very strong blue cheese. A recipe I want to share with you is uh, of uh, Andalusian Narcisia, which is uh, taken from the Exiles cookbook, a book um, from uh, the Andalusian times. But it seems that this recipe has deep roots that can be traced uh, to Persia. The earliest Narcisia recipes involve adding egg yolks at the end of the cooking process, thus creating an impression of uh, narcissus flowers floating on top of that dish. So basically what we have is a lamb omelette of sorts being cut up in the shape of narcissus flower with carrots serving as the stamens. This recipe calls for ram, but lamb will do obviously, which is cut up and then cooked halfway through with salt, olive oil, pepper and coriander. Then carrots are cut up lengthwise and planted on the meat while adding some water, vinegar and saffron. Afterwards, it is time to sprinkle on washed rice and then eggs whipped with saffron. And you can cook it either on the pot or in the oven as the traditional Persian omelette cuckoo. And when it's done, this omelette, or quiche maybe, it's cut up in the shape of uh, the flour. And uh, Narcissia was thought to have aphrodisiac properties as well as being beneficial to those engaged in strenuous exercise. Today, the Iranian Nargesia Sesfanaj is the closest modern descendant of this dish. Medieval Persia was, uh, as we said, big in um, the culinary arts. An early 14th century Baghdadi cookbook begins with the words The pleasures of this world are six. Food, drink, clothing, sex, scent and sound. The most eminent and perfect of these is food, for food is the foundation of the body and the material life. Unfortunately, very soon after these uh, words were written, Baghdad was sacked by the Mongols and uh, all of the manuscripts thrown to the Tigris River, which it was said it ran black with ink. But by this time, the culture of Baghdad, including its glorious cuisine, had been transmitted across the Islamic ruled world, which stretched from India across to the Middle East and North Africa and all the way to Spain and Portugal. The Christian West tasted dialects of this cuisine when it came in contact with the Islamic world, located in Europe itself, both in Al-Andalus and Sicily. And the influence of Persia is, um, as we see, throughout our world. 
today. From this time and onwards, we have mentions of soups with a consistency of porridge, generally known as us, and mainly composed of cereals, vegetables, herbs, and um, they probably have a legacy of uh, old ancient Iranian tradition. The word has passed several centuries earlier from Persian into the Central Asian Turkish languages, and um, the versatile and skillful use of um, animal um, entrails and organs also comes from perhaps Iranian tradition and the wider use of milk products of cask flavoring for example uh, is likely to be due to the Central Asian influences uh, from Mongols and Timurid periods and we've seen pasta also being part of um, traditional Iranian and also Chinese cooking and in the middle we have the vast steps of uh, Central Asia, which was the corridor for Mongols to go through. And um, later on, in Safavid court cuisine, uh, we have um, rice, the use of rice. And from that period come down to two methods of serving rice most popular in Iran today, which is the cello koresh, a combination of boiled white rice, cello, and a stew or sauce koresh. And of course, we have polo or pillow rice, which combine various ingredients with rice. Both are evidently techniques of Central Asia origin, elaborated and diversified in Iran during the first century of uh, the Safavid rule. And that's between the um, very early 16th century and uh, mid 18th century. The popularity of rice and the rising demand for rice on that period led to the expansion of rice growing production, uh, especially near the Caspian Sea, in the Caspian coastal provinces. And in contrast with the Afghanistan and Central Asia, the most popular pasta dishes started vanishing from Iranian menus from, from then onwards. And also millet consumption, which has long tradition in Iran, also fell because uh, rice was preferred. And as we've seen in the episode about the history of uh, biryani and rice, the this um, use of rice in uh, the Safavid court influenced uh, the cuisine of the Mongol Empire. The modern cookery in North India evolved from the adaptation of uh, Safavid skills to Indian traditions. And with this, I'll give you a modern classic of uh, Iranian cuisine, Abkhust, which is a comforting Iranian stew. Um, Popular food, popular um, tea house and street food uh, has a special place in the culture of uh, Iran. And um, an 18th century French traveler, um, Zan Chardin, talks about this dish in his travelogue. Before I go to the dish, let's see the words of uh, Jean Chardin in 1686. They served up the dinner after this manner. There were spread before all the company clothes of gold brocade, and upon them, all along, there was bread of three or four sorts, very good and well made. This done, they immediately brought eleven great basins of that sort of food called pillow, which is rice baked with meat. There was of it of all colors and of all sorts of tastes, with sugar, with the juice of pomegranates, the juice of citrons, and with saffron. Each dish weighed above four score pounds and had alone been sufficient to satisfy the whole assembly. The four first had twelve fowls in each, the four next had lamb in each, in the others there was only some mutton. With these basins were served up four flat kettles so large and heavy that it was necessary to help to unload those that brought them. One of them was full of eggs made into pudding, another of soup with herbs, another was filled with herbards and last meat, the last with fried fish. All this being served upon the table, a porger was set upon each person, which was four times deeper than ours, filled with sherbet of a tarty sweet taste, and a plate of winter and summer salads. After which, the carvers began to serve all the company of each dish in china plates. And as for us Frenchmen, who were habituated to the country of Persia, weighed heartily at this feast, but the fresh comers fed upon the admiration of the magnificence of this service which was all of fine gold and which was worth above a million. So there are a few different types of abgust, with a thick mashed mixture of vegetables, lamb and lentils, called goost or adas, one with lamb and chickpeas, 
or beans and whole potatoes, tomatoes, onions, slowly cooked on a stoneware pot called Dizzy. One called Nokodab, which uh, is the same as Dizzy, but not cooked on stoneware and doesn't use uh, beans. And the cooked ingredients are mashed together to create a thick consistency for serving. Then there's Tas Kebab, which is similar ingredients to the previous two, but cooked to an even thicker consistency. It has also a sweet taste, usually with quince, carrot and dried plums added to it. So this recipe for Abkust, which I've got, I've got on my Patreon page, uh, you can see there in detail what are the ingredients, how much, and the steps. But basically involves uh, lamb shanks and lamb breast, uh, turmeric, salt and black pepper, cinnamon, chickpeas, and kidney beans, uh, onions, tomatoes and potatoes, and uh, dried Persian limes. And basically, yeah, you cook it for a couple of hours and you serve it with pickles and fresh herbs and uh, some Persian bread, flat bread. And this is it. A short, crazy history of Persian food, a Persian food culture. I hope you enjoyed this episode and um, inspired you to investigate more about um, the rich traditions, culture and history of Iran and especially the delicious um, cuisine. So for the extra bit for Patreon backers only, we have a grocery shopping from the Thousand and One Nights, the famous medieval Arab poem. I heard, O happy king, that once there lived in the city of Baghdad a bachelor who worked as a porter. One day he was standing in the market, leaning on his basket, when a woman approached him. She wore a Mosul cloak, a silk veil, a fine kerchief embroidered with gold and a pair of leggings tied with flattering laces. When she lifted her veil, she revealed a pair of beautiful dark eyes graced with long lashes and a tender expression, like those celebrated by the poets. Then, with a soft voice and a sweet tone, she said to him, Porter, take your basket and follow me. Hardly believing his ears, the porter took his basket and hurried be- behind her, saying, O oh, lucky day, O oh, happy day. She walked before him until she stopped at the door of a house, and when she knocked, an old Christian came down, received a dinar from her, and handed her an olive green jug of wine. She placed the jug in the basket and said, And I will leave you with a little anecdote from Persia, where a poor man walked by a stall where food was being cooked. The smell coming from the bubbling halim pot made him almost faint from hunger and pleasure. He took a piece of stale bread from his bag and waved it in the steam, then ate it. The cook asked him to pay for what he didn't. But I didn't eat anything of yours to pay for. The mullah happened to be passing and he called to the cook to get his attention. Then he took a few coins from his pocket, jingling them loudly in his hands so that the cook could hear them and said, Here you are then. He ate the steam from your food and I'm paying you for it with the sound of my money. Thanks for listening. I've been Thomas Dinas and this was The Delicious Legacy Podcast. Before I leave, I just want to give a little shout out to other interesting um, food and history podcasts out there. So if you want to have a listen to something else, a different take or a different uh, way of um, going through historic foods and and recipes, you could listen to the British Food History Podcast by Neil Buttery, which is an excellent podcast about exactly what it says on the tin, British Food History. I really like Sam Bilton's uh, Comfortably Hungry podcast, which is obviously, it has two seasons out and on each season there is a theme uh, so, for example, last uh, season, season two was chocolate. And then uh, next season, which is on working right now, it's all about dark. The theme is dark. And uh, Neil Buttery's British Food Podcast as well. Um, it's between seasons now. So I think the new season 
which is going to be season 8, will be out uh, this fall, this autumn, I think around October or something. They have both have a catalogue of past episodes, so if you do want to listen, do Google them. So both Sam Built on a Neil Battery, together with Alessandra Pino, they have another podcast, which is actually happening right now, which is called A is for Apple. So it's another food history and drink and kind of encyclopedia of food and drink, basically. So yeah, that's uh, another of my recommendations if you care to listen and if you enjoy this podcast, The Delicious Legacy. There are some other ones out there quite interesting too, or at least that I find them very interesting. And of course, uh, both uh, Sam Bilton, she's an acclaimed author, food historian, and Neil Battery too, uh, they both appeared on my podcast uh, on episodes Neil about sugar, the history of sugar, and about uh, female cooks of the 18th and 19th century, and Sam Bilton about uh, saffron. And I will have a new, a new episode with Neil uh, planned for this autumn, probably around September, with uh, the release of his new book, Need to Know, A History of Baking. So that will be a fun episode, so I'll keep you posted and updated about it. Okay, that's all for me for today. Uh, please get in touch with any questions, suggestions, recommendations, or for whatever other reason you want, just to say hi or thank you, or to share your thoughts and recipes. I've been Thomas Dinas, and this was the Delicious Legacy Podcast. Bye.